in the world of medicine, precision is everything. A single misdiagnosis or an overlooked detail, this can have life-altering consequences. But what happens when these mistakes intersect with the legal system? Today, we're delving into the high stakes of forensic medicine, where errors don't just lead to a misdiagnosis, they can actually lead to a wrongful conviction. Today, I'll be reviewing several real-life cases, three of them. And in these cases, these forensic doctors, they used junk science and pseudoscience that ultimately resulted in innocent people being convicted of crimes. First case I'll be discussing is that of Michael Morton. Back in 1986, August 13th of 1986, Mr. Morton got up, went to work, leaving behind his wife, Christine, and his three-year-old son, Eric. And while he was at work, somebody broke into their house and murdered Christine, bludgeoned her to death. Now, if there is a silver lining in this whole case, it's that Eric was left unharmed. Once investigators got wind of this murder, they rushed to the scene and their focus quickly turned to Michael, which is not unusual at all. But with no direct evidence connecting him to the crime, why did they focus solely on him? The prosecution's case, it was shaky from the get-go. Now, the alleged motive is the night before the murder, his wife refused to have sexual intercourse with him, and they believe that in a rage, the next day, he bludgeoned her to death. Enter the forensic pathologist, Dr. Roberto Bayardo. This is the guy who performed the autopsy on Christine, and one of the most critical pieces of evidence that he presented was the time of death. And he estimated this based on the fact that she had undigested food in her stomach. And at trial, Bayardo testified that Christine must have died within hours of eating. And this aligned perfectly with the prosecution's timeline that she must have been killed in the morning while Mr. Morton was still at home. So this was a key piece to the prosecution's case, which eventually found him guilty. So what's the issue with Bayardo's testimony? The problem is stomach content analysis is notoriously, notoriously unreliable. You cannot reliably predict what the rate of digestion is going to be because there are so many confounding factors. It can vary based on things like age, sex, the victim's general health, and even certain diseases can affect digestion, such as diabetes. Also, drugs and medications can affect the rate of digestion. So things like alcohol, things like opioids, and there's also a group of medications called anticholinergics. These can definitely affect the rate of digestion. Furthermore, the type of food that's ingested can affect the rate of digestion. Carbohydrates, for instance, these are digested more quickly than proteins or fats. And all things being equal, a larger meal is going to stay in the stomach longer than a smaller, lighter meal. Basically, the stomach does not empty food in a predictable manner. Then there is this phenomenon, which I think is fascinating, absolutely fascinating. It's called postmortem putrefaction. And this is where postmortem bacteria in the stomach and also in the intestines start breaking down the food. And it changes, it can change the appearance and also the consistency of the stomach contents. This process, this can make it difficult to distinguish between food digested before death and food that has deteriorated after death. Then you also have body temperature and environmental temperature, which also can affect digestion. Cold environments slow down digestion, while warm environments can accelerate it. Therefore, a body that is found in extreme conditions, whether it's heat or cold, this can really skew any time of death estimation based on stomach contents. There is a lack of strong, consistent scientific evidence to support the correlation between specific stages of digestion and time of death. Let's continue with Mr. Morton's case, and there is a whole lot more to this. Ostensibly, there was evidence that was either overlooked or suppressed by the prosecution. For instance, Christine's credit card was used and there was even a check that was cashed after her death, indicating that somebody else may have been involved. 
Even more chilling, little Eric, three-year-old Eric, told his grandmother that a quote-unquote monster hurt his mother, not his father. So why wasn't this crucial evidence considered? And years later, in a twist that's straight out of a crime drama, near the Morton home, they found a bloody bandana. And this underwent DNA testing, and the results were shocking. The DNA did not belong to Michael. It belonged to a guy by the name of Mark Allen Norwood, who was a known felon who was linked to another murder. The discovery of Norwood's DNA completely shattered the prosecution's timeline and pointed to a new theory. So the good news, Michael Morton was exonerated and released from prison on October 4, 2011, after nearly 25 years behind bars. So this man's life had been stolen from him, plain and simple, because of forensic errors and a rushed investigation. The fallout from this case, this has been massive. It's led to a public outcry and ultimately to the passing of the Michael Morton Act in 2013, which requires prosecutors in Texas to share all evidence with the defense to ensure transparency and also to prevent these types of injustices in the future. Okay, let's move on to our next case. This gentleman's name is Keith Allen Harward. This took place in 1982 in Virginia, and this is where he was wrongfully convicted, not only of rape, but murder. And this was primarily on bite mark evidence. Now, at the time, bite mark evidence, it was considered a reliable forensic method. Forensic odontologists testified that Harward's teeth matched bite marks found on the victim, becoming the central evidence against him. Mr. Harward's case begins with a horrifying crime that took place in Newport News, Virginia in 1982. A man broke into a couple's home during the night and brutally attacked them. The husband, he was beaten to death with a crowbar and his wife was raped multiple times. Now the attacker left behind one critical piece of evidence, bite marks on the wife's legs. At the time, police had basically nothing to go on, no fingerprints, no hair, no other physical evidence tying anybody to the crime. Forensic odontologists, they were brought in. Bite marks on the victim were compared with dental impressions from various suspects, but there were no matches that were found initially. And Harward, he was not even a suspect until months later when his then-girlfriend turned him in after they had had an unrelated argument. Harward, who was a Navy sailor, Stationed in Newport News, he was arrested and he had his dental impressions taken. Forensic experts, they claimed that his teeth were a match to the bite marks that were left on the victim. Despite the fact that Harward had no prior connection to the victim, no other physical evidence linked him to the crime, no DNA, no blood, no fingerprints, just bite mark testimony. But that testimony was enough. And in 1986, Harward was convicted of murder and sexual assault, and he was sentenced to life in prison. And that's where things stayed, basically for three decades. Harward maintained his innocence throughout, but with bite mark evidence being treated as solid evidence, solid science back then, the appeals went nowhere. But the truth is, bite mark analysis, this is one of the most unreliable forms of forensic evidence that has ever been used. First off, human skin, this is a terrible medium for making precise comparisons. It can swell, it can move, and bite marks, they can even change as they heal. So the original bite might look completely different just a few hours or a few days later. Secondly, there's no standard process for bite mark analysis, so it's not like DNA testing where we have strict scientific protocol. With bite marks, one expert, he may say, hey, that's a match. And the other may say, I ain't seeing it. So it's inconsistent, to say the least. It's inconsistent, and there is no real scientific foundation behind it. And to make matters worse, studies have shown that bite mark experts are wrong, often. The American Board of Forensic Odontology, they did a study back in 2015. And in many cases, the experts, they couldn't even agree 
if there was a bite mark on the victim, so think about that. They weren't just debating who made the bite, but whether a bite existed at all. Going back to Mr. Harward, it wasn't until DNA evidence came into play that the truth finally surfaced. And in 2016, after having spent 33 years in prison, DNA conclusively proved Harward's innocence, and it actually identified the real perpetrator, whose name was Jerry Crotty. Because of the glaring flaws in bite mark analysis, it's no longer considered a valid scientific method in most forensic cases. Harward's exoneration is just one of several high-profile cases that actually contributed to the growing movement to reform forensic practices, especially those involving junk science. Let's dive into the case of Calvin Willis. This man was wrongfully convicted of a horrific, horrific crime that he didn't commit, obviously. And he spent 20 years in prison, over 20 years in prison, before DNA evidence finally set him free. So this guy's case, it had everything. It had questionable investigative methods. It had unreliable witness testimony. And the use of a controversial technique that played a big role in his wrongful conviction. What was this technique? Hypnosis. Hypnosis. Holy smokes. Hypnosis. Wow. In 1981 in Shreveport, Louisiana, a 10-year-old girl, she was brutally attacked and she was raped in her home. So obviously this crime shocked the community and there was intense pressure to find the perpetrator quickly. But... The investigation, it hit a major roadblock. There wasn't much to go on in terms of physical evidence. The victim, she described her attacker as a black man, but that was about it. No fingerprints, no blood, no hair. And despite a lack of direct evidence, the police zeroed in on Calvin Willis, who was a 22-year-old black man who lived in the same neighborhood as the victim. Now, here's the thing. There was no hard evidence linking Willis to the crime scene. So what was the actual evidence that was used to convict Calvin Willis? Basically, it boiled down to this. The victim's vague description of her attacker and some witness testimony that was shaky at best. Several people said that Willis looked like the suspect, but that's hardly enough to convict someone, right? And remember... This was a time and place where racial bias played a huge role in the criminal justice system, especially when it came to cases involving black men and white victims. Willis's defense argued that there was not enough evidence to convict him, and they were absolutely right. But unfortunately, the jury saw it differently. Here's where things get really problematic. One of the key witnesses who initially couldn't remember key details she was placed under hypnosis in an attempt to, quote-unquote, refresh their memory. Now, hypnosis was actually used more often in criminal investigations during the 70s and 80s, but we now know that it's not reliable. Hypnosis can lead to what's known as memory contamination, and under hypnosis, people might unconsciously create false memories or they may become more suggestible, which means that they're more likely to say what the hypnotist is leading them to believe. And in Willis's case, this hypnotized witness, she was able to identify him as the attacker, despite not having been able to clearly identify anyone before. To put it simply, they used a technique that can distort reality to help convict them. This testimony, it played a key role in convincing the jury that Willis was indeed guilty. Even though the science behind hypnosis, it was dubious at best. And the rest of the evidence, well, circumstantial. As we know, the case against Calvin Willis, it was incredibly weak. And in 2003, after Willis had spent more than 20 years in prison, the Innocence Project, they took up his case. And thanks to advancements in DNA testing, they were able to test evidence from the crime scene that wasn't available back in 1981. The DNA results were clear. Willis was indeed innocent. His DNA didn't match any of the evidence from the crime scene. 
proving that he had been wrongfully convicted. That stuff there, you know. Mm-hmm. And as I walk down that corridor, do I remember saying a prayer. I remember asking the Lord to renew my mind, renew my heart. Get you ready. And, and, and he raised his hand. I said, I got a head out of the for it. Okay. And the first thing happened. In fact, the DNA exonerated him completely. And he was released from prison after spending two decades of his life behind bars for a crime he had absolutely no connection to. And while we now understand just how dangerous that technique can be, it's shocking to think that it was once considered a valid investigative tool. So what do these cases teach us? First, forensic science must always be applied with caution and based on solid scientific evidence. So the wrongful conviction of Mr. Morton, Mr. Harward, and also Mr. Willis shows us the devastating lifelong consequences of not doing so. So this concludes this video. I hope you got something out of it. Hope it was entertaining. And if so, then all the time and effort I put into it was definitely well worth it. So until next time, be safe.